Today we are looking at Messier 8, which is also known as the Lagoon Nebula. What I like about this is, first of all, there's just lots and lots of pretty pictures to show. That's what I'm going to be doing today. I'm going to be showing all these beautiful pictures and talking about what's inside them. But it just encapsulates for me um, just how unique this catalogue is. The Messier catalogue is not a catalogue of objects that share a certain characteristic. It's a catalogue of objects that aren't something. They're all the things that Messier didn't want to get distracted by when he was looking for his comets, which means over the years we've talked about many, many different kinds of objects. Often we're talking about star clusters or galaxies, but today I'm talking about this big, beautiful emission nebula. Messier 8 has the distinction of being one of two emission nebula that we can actually see with our naked eye. It's not easy to do so, particularly this one, because it's in the constellation Sagittarius. So from where we are here in Nottingham, in the northern hemisphere, it's only just creeping up above the, the horizon at certain points of year. The other nebula, of course, is the Great Nebula in Orion, which you can see with your naked eye under very good circumstances. So I'll show you a very wide field view. So what you're seeing here is M8. You see the background star field of the Milky Way. You see another Messier object. So go and check out the video for M20, which is the colorful Trifid Nebula. And in this particular picture, you see something else, which is a nice little visitor. You see Mars right in the center. Mars just happened to pass through the field of view at the time that this picture was taken. So this object is about 5,000 light years away. And if you were to look at it on the sky and see it in its full extent, it would be about three times the diameter of the full moon. So in angular size, it's really, really big. In physical size, it's maybe about 50 by 100 light years. So that, that's still fairly hefty as well. It's a stellar nursery, so it's got all the raw materials to form young stars. The reason it glows is that it's full of ionized hydrogen. So there's so much radiation from the hot young stars that are being born that the hydrogen atoms have actually had their electrons stripped off them. When these atoms recombine, they re-emit that light, and that's what we see here encoded in this sort of red-pink glow. If we zoom in even closer, we see the structure start to pop out. So supposedly it's known as the Lagoon Nebula because of this dark patch of dust that falls around it. In reality, of course, this is a three-dimensional shape. You can see where stars have been formed because there's a young cluster down here. And you can also see that sort of cavities are being excavated by the radiation and the stellar winds, the intense wind of charged particles that are flying out of these hot young stars. And in fact, they're sort of gouging out a hole from the inside out, but leaving this dusty material that hasn't quite been affected. Now, only a few weeks ago, as I sit here filming this now, the Hubble Space Telescope chose M8 as the target for an anniversary image. So they released an anniversary image celebrating 28 years of operation of this phenomenal telescope. And when you zoom into the center of this region, and you, you can't even see it on this image because it's so washed out by all the radiation here. But if I replace this now with the heart of this nebula, it's essentially a work of art. It's very similar to the very iconic image of the Eagle Nebula, which was one of the most famous images, the pillars of creation that Hubble produced. But this is a different object in its own right. So now we're looking at the heart of the nebula. This little bit here, this little bright patch, is known as the Hourglass Nebula for reasons that I actually can see for once. This bright point in the center is Herschel 36. This is a hot, young star. Young in astronomical terms means it's only one million years old. And it's very massive, which means it's very bright. So it's many times more massive than the sun. It's about 200 times brighter than the sun. So this hot, young star is pumping out all this radiation it's physically changing the surrounding medium. It's producing radiation that's lighting up this nebula and making this really, really beautiful picture here. But there's two more things in this image that I wanted to point out because I think they're really neat. The first is you can see th these very dark features here. And in particular, if you focus your attention on this here, this has a great name. This is called a Bach globule. It's named after an astronomer, Bart Bach. This is really the stellar cocoon. This is where we think 
individual stars, not a big cluster of stars, but one or two or three stars are being formed. Remember how hostile this environment is. It's full of radiation, it's full of charged particles, eroding all of this material away. But right in the center of these globules, you've got a very, very cold molecular cloud. It's cold, it's gravitationally collapsing, it's not collapsed enough to form a protostar to heat it up, so it's really one of the coldest objects in the universe. It's about maybe 10 Kelvin, so 10 degrees above absolute zero, and it's full of molecular hydrogen. So rather than the ionized hydrogen I spoke of earlier, it's molecular hydrogen, and that's going to collapse and form a star. Visible and ultraviolet light can't penetrate these objects because they're so cold and so dense, but we may have insight into seeing inside them using infrared telescopes, in particular James Webb in the future, may be sensitive to the very trace amounts of heat and, and thermal radiation signifying the birth of young stars inside these cocoons. Now the final thing that I want to talk about, because this is just really cool, is space tornadoes. Okay, and if you look right down into the middle here, you can see these sort of twisty bits of material connecting these two sides of the nebula. These are actually swirling clouds of material. So they're forming due to wind shears in these stellar winds. So there's a temperature gradient in the material. The surface of, of these clouds are, are getting very hot because they're being radiated from, from these hot young stars. The interior is very cold. Um, and so um, there's a temperature gradient and a wind which causes motion. And you actually literally get these swirling space tornadoes that are maybe about half a light year across, which I think is pretty neat. So all in all, it's a very busy area. It's full of interesting physics and it's full of just aesthetic beauty. And you can see right away why Hubble would have chosen it to be the subject of such a special anniversary portrait. Right, and it's not a small book, right? It's actually got masses of technical detail in it. So the idea of actually transcribing some of this stuff, you know, you've got tables. So here's a whole table of positions and magnitudes of stars, for example, and they've got all their positions and how bright they are on the sky. Pages and pages of this stuff.